Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Macon Bibb County Committee of the Whole meeting today. Today is Tuesday, July the 11th, and the time is now 9.01. I'd like to welcome everyone here today. We have a uh, relatively short agenda today, but the first item on business outside of calling the order is the approval of the minutes from June 13th, 2023 meeting. Uh, can we get a motion to approve the minutes? Motion by Commissioner Wilder. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mayor Pro Tem Clark. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries and be sent to consent agenda. Item three uh, deals with three separate alcohol licenses. Uh, first item A is Surag 2022 DBA Sunoco Food Mart, located at 2260 Sherling Drive, Macon, Georgia. Uh, the, ma the motion is to recommend approval. We get a motion to approve. I'm oh, sorry. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, we want to see if we can get you up here that quick. Okay, so as of yesterday, you still owe the money and they're not in good standing this morning? Okay. Uh, you've heard the, uh, the explanation from our attorney regarding the 2260 Sherwin Drive, uh, and they recommended not approving that because based on our ordinance, they uh, have outstanding tax balances of an excess of $50,000. Uh, so at that time, we get a motion to uh, approve the denial. Got a motion by Commissioner Howell, second by Mary Pritchard Clark. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries. Uh, the next item is item B, which is SL Sausage Company, Macon, LLC, Salt Lake Sausage, located at 5651 Zeblin Road, Macon, Georgia. Uh, this is a new business uh, located on Zeblin Road. At this time, we entertain a motion for approval. Motion to approve. Motion by Commissioner Tillman, second by Commissioner um, Wynn. Any questions? If you no questions, all those in favor of the motion, please okay. say aye. I am aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries will be sent to consent agenda. Got some lights, lights on. on. Item C is a cotton lights. ranch located at 347. Not lights not working. Today. Yeah, you haven't been able. Oh, we live. Okay. <laughs> I forgot we have a new system. So, yeah, you've been missing me since the agenda approval. I don't have your item, sir. Well, I, I don't know how else to do it. I pushed the button and, like, I'm already talking to you. So, something's different. And mine is on also. <laughs> so mine is on also, so I guess it's a new system. Yeah. I want I want to come in on the uh, SNL sausage flow. Uh, yeah, I think. Oh, they all work. Yeah, they're all working. So, so, so that's part of the testing system. We have a new system that we all haven't tested. I, okay, I'll recognize Commissioner Tillman. <laughs> I just want to say with the SNL sausage, uh, I had the pleasure of going over there and I uh, I'm excited about what's happening on Zeblin Road. Uh, more than 10 years ago and sitting on planning and zoning. Uh, that was one of those uh, businesses uh, such as Sonny's Barbecue and so forth that uh, folks sued us about uh, because they did not want the businesses over there. And if you go over there now, you just see that uh, all the issues that folks were complaining about is not happening. And the reason why you have those businesses like that, when they built those lofts over there, um, for those that may not be uh, familiar, they were going to do the same thing they did on Bash Road, would we'll put those businesses at the bottom, but they set too far off the street. And so uh, what was happening now is business over there is thriving, and I'm excited about it, and I remember getting sued about it and uh, being one of those uh, votes that uh, made that project over there happen. So uh, with pleasure, and I've been over there, and y'all should go over there, and see the new uh, business and the new sausage place. It's amazing. It's a sort of a, uh, uh, a mini grocery store as well. So I think people will be pleasantly surprised when they go over there. Just wanted to share that. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you, Mr. Watkins. You have your light on, sir. Uh, they, as soon as they pay it, it can be brought back before commission. Yeah. yeah. And that's the owner of the business uh, that actually owns the building. Is that correct? Is there, since we've denied it, is there like a time limit? Um, you know, before the and to address the question, it is the owner of the building who owes uh, these taxes, both real estate taxes and personal taxes. Okay, we do, uh, go ahead, yes, sir. I guess I was following up. Is there like a time limit on when they pay it before it, before the opportunity to renew it can go straight or can they lose either a deposit or a right to anything? Uh, so uh, at this point, um, I will send out a letter on behalf of the commission stating the reason for the denial recommendation, um, and they will have, uh, 13 days from the date I send that letter uh, to request a hearing, um, and then the hearing process could begin. If they don't accept, if they don't um, request a hearing, uh, then after 13 days, it'll go back before the commission uh, for the commission to make a final decision. And if you're so, if the taxes are paid um, and uh, maybe other actions, if you're moved to um, vote to approve the license at that time, um, there's nothing to prevent you from approving, uh, you as a body, from approving that license. Uh, 13 days before their right for a, 13 days from the date I send a letter uh, on behalf of the commission to request a hearing before they lose the right for a hearing. Uh, and then it would be the next commission meeting after that 13 days. Commissioner Tillman. So, Mr. Attorney, I just want to be clear. Um, it's not the leasee. The, the leasee applied for the license, but the owner who owns the building is in arrears, so we're denying it because of that. That's correct. It, it could be either one, though. We've like, had situations well, well, where I, I think that's I think that's a, a good thing per se, uh, just like having a, a home, if it's got a lien on it, you can't move or whatever. But this is a little bit different, that we adopted this policy um, and to ensure that we can be, be paid. But I just want to be sure that it's not the person that's leasing the building or the person that leased the, the property reached out for us to get a license. But the building itself, because it's in arrears and owed this amount of money, that's the reason why we're denying it. That is correct. The commission okay. stated is because the owner of the building mm -hmm. owes the taxes. Well, I, I guess the, the question then becomes what ramifications or issue does the leasee who may not have known this or repercussions he or she has and how are we dealing with that or have we dealt with that yet or, or do we know, you know, uh, I can answer that. Any any issues like that would be between the lessee and the landowner, and they'd have to work that out. I don't know the circumstances of their contract or whatever, but that's what where the lessee would go if they thought they had something they didn't, they could talk to the owner about it. That would be their remedy. There is also a provision in, in the ordinance, if I recall, that if the lessee has done everything they're supposed to do and we're unable to get an owner to sign off on the good standing, uh, we're actually able to waive that. That's correct. I believe that's correct. Well, I, I yes, just think so. it's something more that we may need to do because let's just say as, as an entrepreneur, if I move into a, a building or property, I'm excited. I don't know that he or she owns this. You know, we can do a background check when we're, um, you know, trying to hire somebody. Is there something that we may need to put in place for these business owners to do a check on property taxes or what have you? Because of course this stuff is public record and maybe that needs to be something that we put out there that folks need to know because now all of a sudden making bill is denying you because the owner of the property may be in arrears. Is that on us, uh, uh, Mr. Attorney? Well, I, I don't, I, let me ask, I don't think it's an attorney question, but I think the situation is, is the, uh, the person making the application for an alcohol and business license is presumed to know the law. And we have a law in our books that basically says that the owner and or lease, leasee have to be in good standing. 
in the past, and I suspect in this case as well, as soon as they get the letter, they're going to bring fifty thousand dollars in, and they're going to be able to lease that property. Otherwise, it's never going to be able to use for that purpose uh, anymore. So we've had several. I mean, it's probably several hundred thousand dollars we've collected in the last year or so on folks that once they get the letter, they bring it in because they thought they could get by without paying the taxes on the property. So um, mm -hmm. anyway, that that's it on that one. Any other questions? We're going to move on to item three, which is the Cotton Ranch located at 347 Cotton Avenue, Macon, Georgia. And what's your recommendation on this one? Uh, my recommendation is approval, Mayor. I, I want to know, I, I just, just for my own purposes, I've received several complaints uh, on this particular owner of this business, and I don't know the owner, so I'm certainly not trying to uh, make any, dis cast any dispersions on him, but... Um, is there any type of restrictions? Because they own, this is a person who owns five businesses downtown and they've been operating, selling alcohol without having an alcohol license there by using another business's uh, license. And I've had several people complain about it to me as well as uh, information about not paying employees already at this location. Um, is there any type of restrictions that we can place on this particular business uh, this early on? Is it something we need to wait until we uh, have problems with them in the future? Mayor, uh, it is news to me that um, there were issues with this building, a business selling under another license. Um, there are uh, certain um, uh, provisions under uh, Macon Bibb County Code of Ordinances Section 4-36 uh, regarding, I believe that's the uh, section regarding the character of the owner. Um, uh, if you have the concerns regarding um, uh, the character of this owner or ways to doing business or potential um, misuse of another owner's license, which is not transferable, um, my recommendation would be to table this matter until more facts can be gathered uh, to make a proper determination. Okay. I don't necessarily want to, to have them continue to operate like that, but I do think we have to, when people have multiple license lights right here, we're going to have to be very particular about making sure that they're uh, acting business and doing, because those, those alcohol distributions are specific to a location. Uh, just like the special permits that we'll be bringing before the commission before long, is we're having folks that are abusing those, and it's going to have to be addressed in a, in a good way. So just wanted to ask for this right here. I know this restaurant is already open. They're doing business. Um, but I know that there's – we've heard some complaints. I think they call the Department of Revenue, so we're just trying to make sure we get an understanding of that. Mr. Watkins, did you have a question, sir? Yes, sir. I guess I want a little bit of follow-up on, on that. I because I am familiar with businesses downtown and other places using special permits and catering, uh, but I, I was under the impression that there was a way to do that correctly. Yeah. Am I mistaken in that? Or This is not a special permit situation uh, on and the now, here. I guess they also can have temporary license. Like I, I guess I've seen scenarios where people have operated, me and, me and Mr. Commissioner Howe were talking about it, um, shoot, last meeting that people have operated for years under temporary status and that type of thing. I think the thing so that I just want drafted, clarity on how they were doing or what they were doing. The things being drafted now is when we actually suspend somebody's license here or have a have a vote on here taking someone's license, we have continued to allow them to operate for a period of time until such time as a final hearing has been held, and there's new legislation that's being proposed based on comments from the commission that will allow us to go ahead and stop those licenses in between and not allow them to continue to do that. And that's when more of your package sales as opposed to these alcohol sales here as well. That, that's my understanding of it. And so, so well, what I do know is you can't have multiple restaurants and have an alcohol license at one and have the alcohol sent to that particular business and use it for another because you're having to transport it from one place to the other. Okay. And that is not allowed. Okay. Okay. And that's what okay. I believe was happening in this situation here. Okay. We, They've been approved for one license, but not all of them. That's correct. I got you. I got you. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Howell, do you have a question, sir? I do. If there is uh, any question at all about uh, employees getting paid or something like that, I, I got a real issue with that because we're, you know, uh, labor department. look out for all, all of our citizens. And if that's going on, I think we need to get to the bottom of it. Uh, I'd like to recommend that we table this for two weeks. That gives us time to do some homework and make sure everything's okay. Second. Okay. Uh, we have a, a motion to table this uh, and a second. It's a non-debatable motion. At uh, this time, we take a vote on motion to table. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries. It's now tabled.
we will not be meeting in two weeks, so it's probably going to be the first week in August, uh, the first Tuesday in August. Uh, who is doing that recommendation weeks? for the attorney for since we table it to uh, gather some information? Yep. We'll and, and just to be clear, uh, that's a labor department issue when we're talking about paying folks. That's something that we should not be involved in. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll move on to uh, item 4A. Item 4A is a resolution of the Macon Bibb County Commission authorizing the acceptance of a juvenile justice incentive grant from the State of Georgia Criminal Justice Coordinating Council for fiscal year 2024 in the amount of $326,346 with no local match awarded to the Macon Judicial Circuit Juvenile Court. Good morning. How are you doing? Good morning. Can you I'm tell us a little bit about this today? I'm glad you can make it. Thank you. I'm thank you. sorry, and I'm running. Um, it's just a grant we've been getting for several. You don't years. mind just for, in the beginning, just tell everybody oh, who you are and what you do. I apologize. No I'm problem. So nervous. I hate this. <laughs> Julie Griffin, and I'm the I'm delinquency coordinator for juvenile court here in Bibb County. I've been here for 16 years, and before that, I was a juvenile probation officer. Yes, ma'am. In this county. Okay, and tell us a little bit about this grant, if you don't mind. This grant is a grant that we have for juveniles that are, it's to prevent the juveniles from being locked up. And we've decreased that number significantly over the past few years. We're down to maybe 20, 28 to 30 a year. We used to be over 200 years ago. Um, and legislation has changed significantly in those times. But what we do is send... Um, counselors into the home and they will counsel the youth along with their parents if there are any other siblings within the home they will pull those youth into the counseling process also but it's primarily to build that communication and those trust and boundaries and educate them about different choices and to give them a different skill set to use within the community or in the school system and it goes a minimum of three months to a total of six months um, they meet in the first 10 days of a juvenile being referred to that program. The counselor has three visits with that family within those first 10 days. After that, it's at the counselor's discretion on how much they see that that family needs. These counselors go into the home. They provide these services, but they also assess the other needs where they lack within the family, whether it's electricity bill, water bill, housing, transportation. And they'll either converse with me, myself or other agencies that they've already made a rapport with here in our community to get them those resources to help them benefit. Some parents have gone and got their GEDs. It's not been many, but it has been a few, and a few is better than, than none. It's just that encouragement sometimes. And you have to meet them where they're at. And a lot of people don't want to take that time. And it takes some, it takes some time to build that rapport because they, they just don't trust anybody. Most of these juveniles don't trust anybody. They don't get that comfort and care most often in the home where they should get it, and they find it in the streets. That's, that's where their minds are, so we have to bring them back and get them back down to the basics. And it's really hard. majority of our kids do stay on for the total of six months. Um, our recidivism rate is really low. I don't have the statistics yet because they have not closed out my grant from the last grant cycle, so I'll get those soon. Okay. And Commissioner Lucas, did you have a question? Um, yes. Um, I'm, I really like programs like this because you reach into the system and pull um, children out of it, hopefully. And from what you're saying, your results are, are pretty good. I, I, want, I had a couple of questions. One is how does a... Um, young person get referred how who makes the decision as to who gets in who gets referred to your program and who doesn't okay we have several different ways <clears throat> so sometimes we'll have a youth that we've already had an encounter with that's been on probation that comes back on a new charge and they get what we call a new adjudication found guilty and We'll go ahead and assess that child. Some of us just communicate so well within the courtroom that we'll say, oh, you think this kid would benefit from services? And it's always a yes. But they do have to meet a criteria. So that means there's certain criteria that CJCC, who submitted, gave us the grant, requires. That's a PDRA. That's the pre-detention risk assessment tool. They go from a low to a high. 
that's from, they can be a negative to a high 15, 16, which is like a HITS pro probation, which is our highest, most intensive. But if they're, as long as they're a two and above, so as long as they're right there at that low, excuse me, then they can get referred to that program. And as long as they meet that, that criteria and they're not a sex, sex offender, and if they are a sex offender from a previous charge, as long as they've received services and counseling, and that has been addressed with a certified counselor, mm -hmm. and they, they too can then be referred for the um, Okay, how valid is the instrument that you just referred to? That's a What's D the? It's a DJJ instrument, so they utilize that. So it's information that they enter into a system. I, I, yeah, I'm I know, sorry. but I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at the val validity of that one instrument. It's not just that one instrument no. that determines, it's no, other other things. Okay, I'm not going to, uh, the six months, I wrote that down when you mentioned that you start out with uh, someone going into the program for three months, but it can last as long as six months. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and I think I did hear you say that the family can be referred for other for Absolutely. an extended period of time. What's the um, parent's responsibility in this, um, in giving permission for that family to become involved in this? The family agrees, the, or the parent or guardian, or will agree to the, be a participant in the meetings themselves. So the child will receive counseling with that parent or guardian, also as individual. So it is to you in the family, the mother or parent will sometimes get those services on their own. But it's not just to can just cancel that adult. They will refer them to their own for their own services if there are other issues outside of the home. But these are specific to what's going on in the home between that parent, child, and or children. Okay. But it takes their wanting to participate. Yeah. I, yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. So far, and we do have those that do not. And we'll talk, I'll talk the probation officers, and it, you know, if we have to come back in front of the judge, we can't make them do it. But so far, the majority do want to participate because mm -hmm. it's so much more convenient for them once they find out they're coming to my home, I don't have to worry about transportation. You know, they just need to make sure that I'm here. And they work with them, and sometimes things come up, and sometimes they don't want to do it in the beginning, and we'll give them a minute, and we'll reassess them. You know, we won't just throw them out of the program. We will give them time to sort of absorb what we've told them, and then we will approach them again. Well, I want to congratulate you and the others who are a part of this program, and I certainly will support approval of this um, um, money, this uh, grant. And then I guess the, is the next one... The next one's um, actually just the, the final. Yeah, ex yeah. yeah, the actual actual program. And I would just certainly encourage uh, you to include very strongly as a part of this program, uh, encouraging or strongly pushing uh, the adults in the household to acquire additional education because I've found that it makes a difference Huge in a difference. family when the children are in a program with some goals and then the family, the rest of the family is involved and they realize some success and it does carry over. So congratulations Thank on you. what you do. Thank you, Commissioner Lucas. We've got Commissioner Wynn and then Commissioner Watkins next. Commissioner Wynn. Yes, good. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Sorry. It's not that bad being here. You're all right now. You're not nervous. Okay, we don't I'm bite. Still. It's just anxiety. I'll be okay. That's <laughs> ah, okay. Listen, um, I think it's a great program and it sounds like it's been successful. If the parent or guardian does not want to participate and you've selected that juvenile, do the, does the juvenile still go ahead through the program? Can the juvenile go ahead through the program without the support of their guardian? The only time that they can continue sometimes, like if a, if a mother does it, but there's another parent, an adult living mm -hmm. like the mom's boyfriend, for instance, if they want to participate and they're actively participating and the mother says it's okay, then we do continue because it is mainly to try to get a hold of that child. Yeah, in, well, that's, in, that's what I'm saying. If, picture, if a yes, parent or, or guardian doesn't participate, you're still going to try to help the child. Yes, right? ma'am. And we have children that will move and go live with a grandparent 
in order to get those services um, just because the parent just doesn't want to do it. And we'll, we'll do wh whatever we need to do to try to reach that child. But there are instances where we can't. You know, th that's just a given. Yeah. It's a sad well, given, but it, it's a given. Well, I'm sure that does happen. It is. Um, because a parent wasn't involved in their life to start with is why they got where they were. But what kind of issues well, for did... Some, for some, they are. But for a lot of these kids, the parents are there. You're dealing with a lot of single home, single right. parent homes. And I was one, <laughs> not to this extent. And it's almost impossible to work a full-time job and maintain complete oversight of your children. I'm not saying it's an excuse, and stuff happens. But I think I just... Mm. We get a little sideways. Yes, I think, we all, I think we all know stuff happens with yes, kids. What, by the way, what kind of things have they committed that put them into this system? The um, juvenile, I mean, it can what, be what first, are they in for? First time offenders, which means they could have been involved or been caught up in a vehicle that had been stolen. Okay. And they previously have a probation. So this just puts them on a high level of let's watch them. And they're placed on probation and they get a new adjudication. Those kind of kids. Some are um, damaging property, disorderly conduct, um, destruction of school property. They've damaged property, different places. A lot more property crimes, um, but there are some a little more serious. Possession of a weapon, yeah. but just as serious as they can get. Definitely, you know, besides murder. Well, that, that's what I want to know. How serious? Besides murder, yeah. yes, ma'am. How serious their issues are that yes. put them in this position. And so. most of the time we don't have those youth anyway. We're just holding them until they go to adult. Okay. We're holding them in a juvenile facility. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Commissioner Wynn. Commissioner Watkins? Hey, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm well. So I appreciate everything that you're doing. Your approach, the approach that we're taking or you're taking to alleviate violence and safety in the community, I think is right. Um, the wraparound services, working out case management with our highest risk and including the family. All that sounds perfect. I'm, I'm curious as to how big our program is. Like what is the, the size or scope? Um, so I guess how many youth folk? 68. How many? 68. 68? So 68 youth or families are being served. What? I hope to serve that number, I apologize. It was up to 75. And then we dropped it back down to 63 to 68. We try to service that many juveniles within a grant cycle. And again, based on that, that's, that's what you can do for the money that you're getting. I'm curious, is, like, is that a big program or a small program in reference to or compared to the number of youth that are committing crimes that would qualify or I guess ranked above a PBR two plus? Is that 100% of the I think Universe. we're at, at a good balance because we fluctuate so broadly. You know, it's never a consistency in any kind of crime. We just have these hot spots where it's more motor vehicle thefts, more gun violence. And then we don't get mainly the youth, depends on whether they get adult charges or some of those kids that sit there for a minute <laughs> on those adult charges and then they're brought back, to, they're kicked back to juvenile. Even when after they're kicked back to juvenile, we can still attempt if that child's not detained or put in the YDC, which is Youth Development Center. They usually go for 18 to 24 to 38 months. If they don't get committed to DJJ and they're coming back to be in the community on probation, we can still provide services to that child. So I guess my question would be how many kids are processed through our juvenile court on Ooh. guilty charges? Um, I'd have to pull those, and you'd have to give me like a time, a specific time frame. But during the grant, like for a year, I mean, so I guess I'm trying to figure out like is 78 half of the youth or no more less less. If you if you don't mind, excuse me, excuse me, if you don't mind, yeah, speaking to that mic there. I know you're looking at Mr. Walker. Thank you. Um, I would say. What you're looking at are actual charges and adjudication. And what we deal with, we've got children that are charged but don't get adjudicated. So number-wise, some of those charges are kicked back to the CHINS program, which are children in need of services. Those are mainly your low level, and we try to refer those out to services. Some of the kids go to the RISE program that the DA sponsors or is in charge of. So I would say 
oh, three to 400 kids maybe are charged every grant cycle, and that's putting it high. Okay. Um, so you really never know, but it can be as low as 200 or 300. In, in your opinion, for the, I guess, the two to 300 that aren't serviced by this grant, um, are they being captured by some other type of wraparound service provider or are those the ones that just go to jail and that's no, the result? No, right. no. They, they, most of them do not go to jail. What we're discussing are all probated youth. So all of these children are in the community. Uh, are in the community and I guess are on probation. Yes, and they, correct. And they, they have a probation officer. Correct. But they lack the second tier of or third tier service that your, that your services provide? Usually, no, sir. Well, they just they just don't get this specific specific evidence based program. But DJJ has grants with other agencies. They provide other services that capture those youth that do not qualify for this service. So there are other services that are going to capture those lower level and those kids that do not fit the minimum criteria for the FFT program. Does that make sense? I'm sorry. It does. Anecdotally, I guess my mind goes to just knowing our youth and the conditions of our city that Correct. most youth probably qualify with the PBR assessment. And the higher, the, the ones that we mostly hear about are the ones that we do try to capture with this FFT. Because, because as you said, I, I, the range would be from 15 to plus 2. Negative. It goes down to the negative, and and that's based on their previous criminal history. So a, a a person with zero would be someone who is. I wouldn't touch. That means they're very low level. That means that they've never been suspended from school. The parents feel like they have no issues with them. This is their first time charge. It's a misdemeanor charge. A negative has been to college or yeah, on the way to college or something. No, I wouldn't say that. Okay. It doesn't mean that they won't. Okay. But it doesn't mean that they won't. So just describe to me just like what a five look like a five per kid would be. I'd say that's a first time probably property crime, damaging property, not really been in trouble that much, not with juvenile court, but they've had some issues at school. They don't have a criminal history. Mm -hmm. They would probably get a three to a four to a five. It would just depend. You could also get one that... Um, the higher the crime, the higher the number, majority. Um, but some kids you'll have that have come in and that first crime's a, a felony, and they have no other history. Go to school, make good grades. Just this one time they get caught up and have themselves in a bad spot. Not excusing it, but, but it happens. I mean, we have some really good kids. And I've dealt with a lot of kids that have done a lot of bad things that are just as respectful as they can be. This will be my last question, but I'm curious. What what would you say that on your caseload of the 78 from last year, what would you say your average PBR score is? Six to a 13. Six to a 13. And a 13 would be a youth that's done something fairly serious. Serious, fairly serious. Okay. And... I would say Am I reading you right? I'm sorry, I said one more. I'm reading you right that it would be fair to say that there are 100 to 150 more youth that we could have served or could not, serve or no? Not okay. necessarily, no. Okay. Because it's all based on that PDRA. But those youth, again, that don't meet this PDRA are referred out to other services that we have in the community and other services that DJJ does have in place. And, mm, Evidence based in this space means programs that are proven to work according yes, to the DJJ. And I know that this is one. Are there programs in our community that yield, to your knowledge, that yield a better output for, for these high risk youth? Not to my knowledge. Okay. The only other evidence based program I'm aware of or familiar with in Bibb County that DJJ has a contract with is MST. Okay, and if you don't get them, then MST gets them in this space, or that's not, I shouldn't think that. When I commute, communicate with DJJ, like if they don't meet this criteria for my program, I'll say, listen, this, this child doesn't meet FFT, doesn't meet, make sure you send them a referral for MST. Okay. I send it to them and their supervisor, and they make sure that that child gets those other services, because they are in charge of that aspect, if I cannot get them into FFT. 
but FFT for us seems to be the best. It's the longest running program we've had in juvenile court with the best results since I've been employed. Thank you for your indulgence. I'll, I'll, I'll follow up offline. Thank you, thank you, I'm but just good information. Like an ant, so I just get nervous. Yes, ma <laughs> yes, ma no, ma'am, no need for that. It's good, good information. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Tillman? Uh, I'm going to say this to you. I'm going to sure. say this to the commissioner. As a former DJJ officer, I understand the language. Everybody else don't know what y'all talking about. <laughs> it's hard. Y'all cannot come in here using acronyms. Okay. People don't know what you're talking about. FFT, MTS, PBR, DJJ. Everybody don't know that. And I'm talking about the public and whatever. <laughs> we got to start saying what this stuff is. Department of Juvenile Justice is DJJ. Because one of the things that this commission is doing is a program called the MVP that everybody is trying to get a group on youth violence and you're at the forefront of it. And so um, we all want to help and be a part of it. And so this is not the place today, but I'd love to get with you and just see what y'all are doing and get us, some of us more involved. Okay. That's all I'll say. Thank That's you. Fine. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, sir. Um, I'll uh, ask Commissioner Lucas, you like to make that motion. I know you know all the acronyms. <laughs> mm, okay. Got a motion by Commissioner Lucas. We have a second. Second by Commissioner Tillman. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. That was the acceptance of the grant. Item 5A is actually the approval uh, contracts to purchase a resolution making Bibb County Commission authorize the mayor to execute an agreement with Evidence Based Associates LLC for services provided to making Bibb County Juvenile Court not to exceed $326,340. Six dollars <laughs> using juvenile justice incentive grant funds with no local match. Uh, can I get a motion to approve? Motion by Commissioner Tillman. Do we have a second? A second by Commissioner Jones. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries. Sent to Senator Jones. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. Uh, item 5B is a resolution of making Bibb County Commission authorize the mayor to execute an agreement with Renfro Construction Company LLC. An amount of $431,317 for renovations to the Bibb County Courthouse to be paid from the 2018 Splice Fund Juvenile Courthouse. At uh, this time, we'd entertain a motion for approval. Motion by Commissioner Wilder. Do we have a second? Second by Commissioner Jones. Commissioner Watkins, you got a question? Yeah, and you sent the email to the with the same question. Um, where is where can we or when can we? I, the overall plan for the courthouse. Like I know we got a lot of money tied up into uh, splossed in the future. We've we've done a lot in terms of the buildings. Where can I see the full picture of what needs to happen and what remains with the courthouse? Um, the only thing we're waiting on now is Wakefield Beasley to do their uh, their drawings and input from the courthouse so they can construct an uh, RFP that we can send out to get an actual bid. So we pre previously provided the monies that we believe are in the courthouse and the parking lot fund for the courthouse that was voted on um, in the last plus. But we're getting down toward the end. As you recall, the amount of money that was appropriated some six years ago uh, are, is not relative now because prices have gone up, inflation, what used to cost you 40 million would cost you 80 million dollars today. So we've been trying to value engineer this by putting courtrooms at the courthouse, at the mall, by doing some um, purchases in the building behind them, uh, the courthouse to move some share of, share of service and other things in there, uh, by doing some renovations inside the courthouse already to try to meet what the voters approved and also take care of the needs there. The final piece of that puzzle outside of the parking piece is to have the um, scaled down version of the newly renovated courthouse at the same location. And Wakefield Beasley is putting that together. Some of those things are mostly security in nature uh, it would involve moving the uh, entrance to the Mulberry Street as opposed to the Walnut Street entrance for a lot of reasons. Number one, being security. Number two, being allowing people to get inside of a building instead of waiting outside in long lines in the extreme heat, cold, rain, whatever it may be. Uh, but also freeing up a lot of room for expansions. The DA says she has run out of room, so she has asked for space. Uh, we need to remodel with that. And then uh, judges have made several requests as well, mostly security and upgrades. So. To answer your question, once we get that back from Wakefield and Beasley, uh, we'll send the RFP and at that point in time, we'll get an estimate on how much money is there, if it's sufficient to meet the needs, 
or it will not meet the needs and whether or not there's any excess funds uh, that would uh, be left over from the project after everything is done. Okay, and do we have a timeline so I won't just keep asking every week on Wakefield Beasley? It's probably gonna be somewhere around January before we're able to send out an RFP. So Wakefield Beasley will have the drawings completed in January or? They'll have it hopefully by the end of in December and then we'll send it out for a bid in January. And the drawings that they're working on are solely for renovations to the existing building. The idea of building a new footprint from the ground up is clearly off the table. Oh yeah, yes sir. There's, there's not enough funds in this spots to do that. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, uh, okay, we got a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries. Item 6A is a quick claim deed. This is a resolution to authorize the mayor to execute a quick claim deed in favor of Robert and Adele Rickert for the sale of property totaling 81 hundredths of an acre or less of the former unopened right of way on Bonita Place for a fair market value of $32,400. Uh, that's my motion. Can I get a second? Second, oh. second by Commissioner Jones. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. I'm sorry, we have a question? Yeah, y'all carry me so fast. I was curious, what is Winfro Construction doing? They're doing the uh, renovations up in the state court. And that's outside the scope of that's... No, it's part of that same process. I mean, it's, it, it's not part of that same bid, but that's something we've been working on for a while to try to renovate it for Judge Hanson and their group up there. So out of curiosity, like what drawings or plans are they working from to get that done? Like how does that? Just on that specific area. This is something that's been in the works for, for a little while. And there's absolutely no chance that the work that they're doing tomorrow would get affected by whatever Wakefield Beasley comes back with. They'll do it around or they're no, no, the majority of what Wakefield Beasley is doing is is uh, on the other side of the building, and you're thinking about just about three or four levels that you have to go up once you come in that side of the building over there. So yeah, that's I guess I'm like, asking, is there like a picture with like numbers and little arrows or something on what's happening in the courthouse somewhere that is shareable? Well, I mean, Wakefield Beasley sent y'all one a few years ago prior to my arrival, and that encompassed a whole new, with special elevators in the back for the judges, new hallways being built and all that. But that was like the forty million dollar one, right? That that was probably what would what I say would be an eighty million dollar now. But yeah, right. that's so what y'all put forty million dollars they, in. So what did they work? So they, they took those be, plans and right. they eliminated the things that have been done to try to increase security there. Some of the work that was done in magistrate, civil court, in that area, uh, and they've removed those from the project. And we've asked them to take um, the original plans they have and modify that on the things that have not been done, including this project here. They already know about this project as well for the state court up there, so that will not be included. But it will come out of the same money, as you, as you know. So we'll get a new presentation from Wakefield Beasley, not including this property here, but including all the other things that have to be done, including the things that the district attorney has asked for. Can I add just one thing? Because sure. that, um, this is actually the, the last piece of the first set of renovations that have happened. He's been waiting for a little over two years for, and it's a courtroom that's already there that's just having some build out to it. Um, so it's not as involved as what now Wakefield Beasley is going back to work on for the other things that have come up. And we have a new DA, new space needed, that sort of thing. Can you not hear me? <laughs> All over. This is the last piece of the first portion of the renovation that's been going on at the courthouse. So many of those offices have already been renovated. This third courtroom was kind of put on the back burner and they've, it's really been in play for about two years. So this construction piece is just to go ahead and finish that portion up. You'll continue to see some things come forward for approval with what we are continuing to do in the existing building. Some of that's gonna be AV upgrades that many of the courts are needing, and so that's coming. Um, so it's it's not stopping, but we are waiting on Wakefield Beasley for the overall redesign since the first design didn't work. These have been all the pieces we've been putting together to keep them as secure and happy as we can at this point. Commissioner Lucas. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to agree with Commissioner Watkins on the fact that we need to have all the pieces, a complete picture of what's changed. Uh, it's been a while since we voted on some of these 
monies to go to various things. It's been a long time since the people voted on the SPLOST. And pretty soon, uh, if it hadn't already started, it should have. There's a discussion of the next SPLOST that we're going to ask people to vote for. And I certainly want to be able to support that. But I need to know all that y'all know. And a lot of things, we've given you permission because the legislation says, you know, and the mayor's empowered to go ahead and take care of the rest of the details. Well, what we need to know is what those details are. So I think it would be good for us and for citizens who voted to support the SPLOS to see where we are. Just like you do the periodic reports on the, the mall and the amphitheater and all of that, people find out where their money is going. So I think it's a it's a smart thing for us now that all, all of this stuff has been done. We've purchased properties. We've eliminated stuff from some of the plans. There have been a number of things, and I'd just like to see a total picture. And so I think it would be really good for citizens to know what actually is in place now. And especially since the courthouse, the new courthouse, which I was in favor of, it really looked like a neat drawing, but it's out the window. It's no longer on the, the radar. So I'd like to see what is, what's already been accomplished and how much more we have to do. Uh, a review of the amounts of money that have come in, and I understand that's come in better than was anticipated. So all of those kinds of facts, I think, need to be shared to bring people up, because the bits and pieces, you know, we kind of grab them, but we have access to more than most people do. So I think it would be good for us to do uh, well, I mean, we've gone on the field trips and we've seen some of the changes, the new purchases and some of the other things. I, people hear you. They hear what you say. But if you show them what you've actually done, then it sticks better and you're able to better, uh, to be in a better position to ask them to support something else in the future, which I certainly hope that we're starting to think about the next blast because we need to replace that jail. Thank you, Commissioner Lucas. Just, I want to make one clarity. The, the amount of money doesn't matter how much you're collecting per year. That, that amount of money ceases when you hit that number. So that the, the only thing that has changed is the rate that we're collecting it, uh, as far as collecting it ahead of time in a much faster pace because the Macon Biff County has done a wonderful job of getting sales tax in and, and tourism, et cetera. But that number doesn't change. So just because we're getting more money in, it doesn't mean there's more money for these projects. The, the projects are capped out. Our entire effort has been to try to accomplish the goals that were intended uh, back when the courthouse. It was never, um, the, the spots didn't call for a brand new courthouse. Um, it calls for certain things to be met, including like the juvenile justice uh, uh, department over there has been been worked on ju the juvenile center and other security measures so we're trying to work this out because I can tell you from speaking to mayors across the state of Georgia most everyone's projects have doubled the cost mm -hmm. and simply what you thought you were making a good good faith effort to put money aside thinking it was going to take care of the needs uh, when you pass this will not take care of the needs today that's why we've been juggling the auditorium and other things to try to keep up and and make sure we can still get the projects in this courthouse the reason we've been doing all these other things is really to value engineer. The information you're asking for is going to be in that Wakefield Beasley report. Uh, I can't give you what I don't have, and I wish I had it yesterday, but Wakefield is, is working on that um, along with other projects they have. We feel like they would be the best company to do it since they did the original drawings. But times have changed since they did their last things, and we don't have that reporting yet. When we get that in, you'll be certainly uh, able to see that, and we put the RFP, you'll be able to see that. We have tried to be, and we do, we are open and transparent. That's why we have this trip to the malls to see the courtrooms. We went over to the Mulberry Street property, the Walnut Street property, to show you what we've done in there. Um, but we can't really show you what we haven't um, accomplished yet because this is the end of the money for the splots, as you mentioned. And the courthouse is one of those things we've been kind of just picking at as we run along because there's not enough money to, to do um, the entire project in today's number. So 
we'll bring that back to you just as soon as we can. Uh, I can get Clay Murphy to give you um, a total again that we just gave you, I think about a month ago of the remaining funds in that account uh, after this $431,000 uh, is out of there for Renfro. And then uh, we'll take a look at it at that point in time. I'm just talking about a complete overview of what's been done. There are a lot of people, there are only, what are there, 10, 11, 11 of us, and some others who are aware of a lot of the things that have taken place. And I'm just saying that everybody has a right, since they voted, they had the uh, right to vote on this, they have a right to an update on it. And I think that they will smile like we smile a lot when we see the results. But if people don't know the results, then they question it. And you give them, you know, an opening to question a lot of things. Well, I thought this was going to happen. I thought there was going to be a new courthouse. There's not going to be. When did that change? You can answer all of those questions by doing sort of a disclosure. And it helps us to be able to show citizens that we are not just sitting up here, that we are indeed voting for things that have, have some impact. So that's that's it. I, I'm glad to know that there's gonna be and I, and that I update. And I appreciate that, and I think that's one of the reasons that you, you uh, we all participate in that site visit. We're getting down that's to the end of the That's just us. Month. That's us, though. But that's that was not... us with cameras, with promotions, with an invitation for the public. That's an open meeting that we went out there to see. Uh, and there was news interviews and there was media there to show that. We can't take everybody in the community on a, on a field trip, but they're certainly welcome to come. But we wanted them to know this is the amount of money that we have left over. These are the projects and this is the need in those areas. And that's what we're working on for that. But I understand what you're saying. Uh, I think we've done a good job of actually getting out what we've been done through the hub and through all kind of other pro you know, promotions. We're getting out to the end of money. If you want to have a uh, end of the money kind of this is what we've done overview, I think we'll be happy to put that together for you so people can mm -hmm. see what, what happened there. Yeah, so that's fine people forget okay. quickly. Uh, so let's get back to the item that we're talking about, which is this... Uh, be needed drive property here. Let's go ahead and take a vote on that. We do have a motion and second. All those in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. That motion carries to be sent to consent agenda. We're going to move on to item 7A, which is a request for street lights. This is a resolution reviewing the recommendations of facilities management to deny a request for the installation of, a, of additional street lights along with Candlewick Court pursuant to Article 10 of Chapter 29 of the Macon Bibb County Code of Ordinances. My understanding that there was two requests contained in this. The first one was uh, request was accepted as necessary, and the second one was not. And the reason it's before you is because we have a partial rejection on here. So at this time, if you don't mind, identify yourself and let us know the reason for this uh, rejection of these lights. I'm Kevin Poss, Assistant Director of uh, Facilities Management. What uh, we did when we surveyed this, it was a like I say, a partial denial. The request for three street lights on is it Kimberbrook. Uh, uh, Kimmer Ridge, excuse me, and one on Candlewick Drive. The standard we use is typically every other pole. It's the same uh, standard that George Power uses, unless there's specific reasons for, for more. And we don't mind, put, we put them on every pole, but it's going to get quite expensive. Uh, so when Jason surveyed this, he put one on, he added two on Kimber Ridge, which made one every other pole, and then there was already one in the in the cul-de-sac of Candlewick. And there's a one, only one other pole on Candlewick, which was the picture that was up just a moment ago is the, uh, I think, is the cul-de-sac of, of Candlewick. So that's what the, we added to, but did not add the third on Kimber Ridge and an additional on, on Candlewick. Okay. Thank you for that explanation. At this time, we do entertain a motion for approval. A motion by Commissioner um, Wynn. Do we have a um, second? Yeah, I got you. We got a second. So Nobody's going to second. This is this is so we can discuss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Got a second on on Commissioner Tillman, and this time we'd uh, entertain a question for Commissioner Watkins. Is is the customer pleased with our decision? We, uh, we haven't, as far as I know, we haven't had any feedback from the customer because uh, after they don't get from the way I understand the process works, they won't know they were denied until the vote. And then they'll get a letter saying you were approved. Is that correct? That is correct. Mr. So if you'll just wait to get up to the microphone, please. And identify yourself again. 
Hi, I'm Assistant County Attorney Adriana Beavers. So the way this resolution has been drafted, it is for you to review the recommendation from our facilities management department. Um, I have left blanks in the where now therefore be it resolved where it can be denied or granted and the um, where the recommendation to deny can be accepted or you can overrule that and grant this request. And then it says shall or shall not. So if you choose to override the recommendation of facilities management, that would be shall be installed. So it's you have the option to deny or approve the recommendation. So to be, cl to be clear, yeah. what exactly <laughs> is the recommendation and Facil where? Facilities management is recommending that additional streetlights not be installed on Candlewick Court. They have recommended for approval the installation of extra streetlights on Kimmeridge Drive, which based on our recent updates to the streetlight code, do not need to come before the commission to ensure efficient administration. So those are already approved. So, so this, this, what they're voting on only is the recommendation to deny uh, the request for installation of the lights on Candlewick only. Yes, sir. Okay. So it would be a, a motion to accept the recommendation or to reject the recommendation. In other words, if they approve the recommendation, it's denied. If yep. they if they want to go another way, they they overrule the recommendation. Point of information. Yeah. <laughs> so they asked for four a total of four lights. They've already gotten two approved. Three are approved. The one light they requested on Candlewick Candlewick is the one that we're discussing up for your today. Review. That's yes. what we so we're discussing one light on Candlewick. That's yes, correct. All right, the other three have already been approved, not up for discussion. Right. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. And the one light on Candlewick, the reason is, the reason or the, the pro to installing it would be we have a fully satisfied customer. The con, the con would be? I the, the, the reason that one was denied because there was one at the intersection, the T intersection of, of Candlewick and Kimberick. There's one there and there's one in the cul-de-sac. This pole is is not actually middle of that block. It's down further toward the uh, the cul-de-sac. In in yards or football fields, how how far is it away? Thanks, Two hundred and two feet from the. I'm excuse. That's the wrong one. Two hundred two feet. feet. Eighteen feet. Two hundred eighteen from pole to pole. So about twenty thirty yards. I do that right. 60 yards, okay. Go ahead. 65 okay. yards. And I guess in our option to either put a light there or don't put a light there. Yes, sir, that's it. They asked for a light, but I mean, I guess I don't have the, the, the drawback to putting the light up is what? I don't have a problem with putting up a single I light. I think the only, just to be clear, I think the only drawback is is that we set up this uh, policy for a reason to have our people who are in the business uh, in conjunction with Georgia Power determine whether or not um, we need to put a light there or not. Not that somebody wants one, but we need to actually do that before we invest the time, money, and energy in there. Uh, certainly, you always want to please the customer, but you can't do that in every single occasion because you price yourself out, out, of, the, out of the market, number one, but also not everybody wants a street light every so many yards or feet. And it looks like there's a, adequate coverage there based on what our people are telling us who do this on a day in and day out basis. Um, it just, just, just my, my argument. Commissioner Jones. Yes, sir. Just to get extra clarification, Kevin. So you have approved one on every other poll, which is standard procedure, Yes, sir. which you usually do what Georgia power recommends. Yes, sir. So to approve this means we're going to de deny this one extra poll that doesn't meet the criteria. Yes, sir. Is that right? Okay. Now it's clear. It was clear as mud, but now it's clear. <laughs> Mr. Lucas? Yes. Was the only criterion the placement of the poles? Was that the only thing that was used to determine that you would not recommend placement of that other light? The footage is also taken into, uh, into consideration. You know, footage between poles. If you have, sometimes are you have they all plus. consistent? Is it the same distance in there between every pole? There's between like there's 200 feet between one set of poles, and then there's 120. 
So it's not consistent. Not really consistent. This street is rather rolling and, and, uh -huh. and, and curvy. Uh, has one big curve. And, okay, and who problems. made the request? How did the request come? And I'm sorry I, if I got that information. Just It was uh, Miss Barbara Crawford. Uh, she lives at 105 Kimmer Ridge Drive. Okay, was it on? It was on behalf of a neighborhood association, or was it just an individual? Just an individual. Okay, was there a night visit uh, to determine how dark it gets in that area? No, ma'am. J Jason, our, our electrical manager, is pretty much the one that does our surveys. Due to yeah, I, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm like you. I know that, um, you know, we can't uh, go along with every possible request, and we have to depend on the department, the experts who've been doing this. But if the, the distance between poles is the only determiner, then I would want the department to go back and take a, a, a drive at night to see what the lighting is like I'll, in there because that's that what they used to. I take that as a motion to the table so they can go back out. Well, there. yeah, uh, I moved, <laughs> moved the table. <laughs> no, I got a motion by Commissioner Lucas. We have a second. Second by Commissioner Watkins. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Does not care. Okay, we'll continue to talk about streetlight. Well, but why would you not write it? I we thought have, that it was standard procedure. Because, excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt. Do, would y'all have a problem with going out at, at night? Don't y'all have somebody to do that? No, ma'am. We have, we have three electricians to take care of the whole county. Okay, that's, in, that's I have, including our manager that, that does all of. I mean, when we, we, we did used to, in the past, do nighttime surveys, we had seven electricians back then. Just, or, yes, sir, we, all our electricians work eight to five. Uh, and, uh, and on call, of course, we have on call. Who represents our, that area? Is it me? No, it's uh, it? Commissioner, Mayor Pro I do. You, I thought it was Seth or Mallory. No, it's Mallory. Mallory, no. I think uh, Mallory's since the department is short staffed and they don't have him, I, I thought y'all were still going and determining because one of the things under pedestrian safety and violence prevention and all of that is making sure that these very, very dark areas have additional light. I thought that's what we were committed to. Uh, when we've uh, voted to support additional funding, ha a half million in this budget, a half million in the other budget, and then 100000 in the previous year, I thought that was to make sure that there was additional resources to handle stuff like this. I think just to deny it, I think that's just, I don't know why we sit and do stuff like this. We we don't even want to go back and take a look at it and that's y'all's job. Y'all don't have a problem with it. You just don't have the staff. I think the commissioner representing the area ought to go at night and see if there's sufficient or insufficient lighting. Um, that's why I asked because I was going to do it. If well, he's, he's, he's seated right beside you. He's got his light on if you let him talk. You let him talk. He's what? He's seated right beside you and he's got his light on. Well, I thought somebody else said Mr. it was Jones. a different one. Oh, it's you. It's Mr. Jones, with okay. you. Yeah. Let, let, let me handle District 4 and you handle District 3. You know, that's what we're trying to <laughs> yeah. do. Yeah. I solve problems members. every week so, 10 times more than District no, 3 does. I got Commissioner Jones on mic. Like, I have the floor, please. No, you don't. I recognize Commissioner Jones. I'll come back to you, Commissioner Lucas. When did you do that? Just about two seconds ago. I have not given, I have not finished what I had to say. Ms. Lucas, and will you let Commissioner Jones talk and I'll come back to you? What I want to say is that we have committed ourselves as an <clears throat> entity to serve the public. One of the things that we have said we're going to do is to increase 
the safety or the feeling of safety in these neighborhoods. <clears throat> and it's a simple thing. And to me, it's idiotic for us to sit up here and not even say we're going to go out and take a look at the area. And you know that the department doesn't have sufficient um, uh, staff, they say, to go and do it. So, I mean, this is ridiculous. Y'all, we can look, we look silly sometimes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Lucas. I agree. Uh, Commissioner Jones? <laughs> Yeah, I'll agree with the last statement. Yeah. Commissioner Jones. By not approving this amendment, you penalize the other people in the neighborhood. The distance between poles is totally irrelevant. They're never the same. They're never the same. Is that correct? Correct. They're never the same. Every street's different. Different poles are placed in different places. To criticize unfairly people in facilities and all these great people we have in public works who respond to who's criticizing anybody? Uh, Commissioner Lucas, You're please. So Commissioner Lucas, you don't have the floor. That's another big word. That Commissioner you don't Lucas, understand. let's yeah, not be you're, silly. You're, Look it up. Yeah, you know, it's got your picture beside Ridiculous. it. Your mama's picture. Oh, guys, come on. Say it. He apologizes. We're going to maintain decorum in here. Uh, that's neither those comments are professional and something that we don't uh, will not adhere to. So we we'll let true. Commissioner Jones uh, make his statement, and the next time if someone wants to make a call, the question we'll take a vote and move on. If it passes, it does. If it doesn't, we'll ask them to go back out there and look at it. So, Mr. Jones, I'm what you finish, sir. Anyway, just trying to make the point that public works, facilities, all of these good people work in times of emergencies. When too long ago we had a, a bad storm out in Zebulon Road where 30 or 40 traffic lights went out. All of these people were working uh, wee hours of the morning in concert with Georgia Power to protect and restore safety to the citizens of Macon Bibb County. So uh, if we deny it, you're going to penalize the people that want the lights. We made a policy to increase the number of lights. We've done that. We don't charge the citizens for it now. So uh, I call for the question. We still have lights. I call for the question. We have a second. We still have lights on. I have discussion. We have a second. I have discussion. So it's, it's call the question is non-debatable. Do we have I mean, a second? But you have discussion, so you can't call for the question if you still have lights mm -hmm. on. You can't just halt discussion. Mm -hmm. I know that. Yes, I'm, I'm just going by procedure. It may fail, but I'm telling you, when we have someone call the question, it's a non-debatable motion. I'm just asking for a second. But it's been right. protested. It's Back. We have a second by Commissioner Wilder on calling the question. This procedure, you can talk to the attorney beside me if you want to. Um, we're just going to maintain protocol here. All those in favor of calling the question, please say aye. 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 No. No. Opposed, nay. Okay, the no. question is not. The question does not get called, so we'll move on to the next light that we had on, and that's Commissioner Wilder. I, I'm, I've got it pulled up. As there's three houses on each side of the road down through there. Now, clear up uh, the one that you're putting on the corner. Is it there yet, or is it still in the process? Uh, on the on the corner of Kimmeridge. It, it's it's an existing the one uh, the corner of Kimmeridge and Candlewick is an existing light. Okay. At that intersection there. And there's one in the in the bottom of the cul-de-sac. Sir. And there is one in the bottom of the cul-de-sac. Yes, sir. And so there's 200 foot different distance there. Yes, sir. Okay, or 218. I'll be glad to ride out there sometime and check it out. It's not a problem, but you know. Thank you. And to be clear, if I if could, we don't mind going out at night. We don't do it every time because we have hundreds of streetlight quests sure. monthly. Uh, when we do have a pedestrian safety issue, uh, a pedestrian fatality, we do go look at it at night. Uh, it's just, it's, it's over time. And if with every streetlight request we get, it'd be impossible. We would never get our day work done. Sure. So, I mean, it's, it's not that we mind doing it. We're here to serve. 
and we'll put a street light on every pole in Bibb County if you want to. That's not a problem. We won't be able to afford it, but but that's neither here nor there. Thank you, Commissioner Howell. You remember you? I had the same on. question that Commissioner Wilder did. I I was unclear if there was one at the corner of Candlewick and in, in Kimber Ridge. <clears throat> yes, the, there's one at that closest pole. It's not right at the intersection. It's kind of the angle uh, from from the. But there is one at that intersection. Yes, sir. Uh, Commissioner Wynn. Uh, yes, sir. We we have a criteria we use for putting up these street lights. You use the poles. And it's, it's, it's not just the distance either. It's all, so we try to, when we get requests, every other, if, when we first started getting requests, it was usually for one light. Now we're getting more saturation on them. And so we go by, we, we can't, we don't do an engineering study, uh, which would go out with photometrics because we can't afford to do that either. That's, that's an engineering study that takes months to do uh, and go out and kind of light feet. And, and so, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I have a little concern about one person requesting this light where there are others on this street. You know, some people don't like street lights out in front of their house because it's too much. I mean, I've had it in my neighborhood, but that it, it's just got to have some criteria where we don't, I don't think we should have just one person that decides for a street light on, on the street. In the, in the previous uh, ordinance, there was a, Petition. Petition. Right, petition. And, they, and they had to get so many. Right. And to simplify it or to, I'm not. Right. I, there, there was a percentage before, but this commission chose not to, to, to change that, and they did a new ordinance uh, that we're having to go by now. Yes, sir. So I appreciate your response. Commissioner Wynn, do you have anything else? Just, I forward? just want to tell Commissioner Jones, I'll have a date with you one night, and we can go, go look at this light, okay? <laughs> All right. Commissioner Watkins. Until they make me a visit. Commissioner yeah. Watkins. So. <sighs> Not so much on this light in particular, but I'm curious how how many street light requests, rough estimate has the has your organization received since we've changed the ruling, and how many have been installed over the past year? I'd ha I, we've got a spreadsheet that counts. Uh, I, I don't keep numbers in my head because uh, there's so much other stuff, but I, I I would guess no less than two to three hundred requests. There's too many. Just too many. Yes. Said about 100 requests, 300 lights installed is what I heard. Yes. Okay. 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 If if approval happens today, typically how long would it take for lights to be installed? Simply at the at the mercy of Georgia Power. We've had some that were approved, and we sent the request to Georgia Power October, November last year that still aren't put up. It's, it, it, that's all Georgia Power, and, and we have we have some meters we've asked to be set at Convenience Center number three mm. two months ago that still haven't been set. So, so on on Cherry Street and MLK for the last roughly couple weeks, um, good chunk of those lights are out. Are we aware of that, and how do we get them fixed? Yes, sir. They were out for a, July fourth, and that was why. That's, there's the the wire on the ground is burnt. The conduit is deteriorated. It's been there for 60, 70 years. Uh, as far as we're aware, they just repaired them. It should be back up and lit. We haven't had a report that they're back out. I know they were out last night along MLK. All right. Um, and and again, as it relates to this, I'm I'm in favor of. Again, us trying to put the lights up. There's a request for lights in this area. I think I remember a part of our our code being that before we denied it, that we did do a drive a drive by at night. Um, I think there's some willingness from some of us to assist your department with that, at least on this one in, one issue. Um, so I'm in favor of tabling it till that happens. I don't know. Do okay, I, do I need we got a motion, motion and a second to table. We'll take another vote on that. All those in favor of table, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Nay. All right, we're going to take a vote one way or the other then. Um, so at this time, we have a motion and a second, and I'll call for a vote. We'll take a roll call vote, beginning with Commissioner Wynn. We're voting to, uh, there's a motion to approve the denial on the table. 
A yes vote does what a no vote does what? A yes vote approves the denial, which means if you vote yes, there will not be a light there. Right. That's correct. Well, they already visited. Can, can I speak? That's correct. Two, that's correct. I think it was four to two. Something. That, that's what it means. Yeah. Well, it's either going to pass or fail, so I think we just take a vote. Okay. It's so Commissioner Wynn, how do you vote? Yes. Yes. Commissioner Lucas, how do you vote? Mr. Jones, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Walter, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Howard, how do you vote? Commissioner Watkins, how do you vote? No. Commissioner Tillman, how do you vote? No. That's right. All right, so it, it fails, so it will not be denied this time, and we'll send somebody out there to check it out, and we'll put it back on the counter for another vote. Can, okay. I, can I speak to this? Yes, sir, go ahead. If I get I just, your light on, sir. I, I personally want to uh, thank facilities uh, for the job that they're doing. Uh, to sit here and hear commissioners say they want to go out and do your job, and visit the sites and all that, and you've already done it. I knew there was a problem. I never agreed with the ordinance in changing it because people were only paying $100. Uh, and then this commission did away with that, and they had to go out and get petition to make sure that the neighbors all agreed. That was the best way to do it. I do remember not supporting this, and so it's opened up a floodgate because making bid will pay the bill. I remember having uh, Dale Walker, our former county manager, and I ride up and down Eisenhower at 9.30 at night. We petitioned GDOT, and we ended up with 28 lights on uh, Eisenhower Parkway. And you guys helped facilitate that. That was a tedious step that we, we did making bill, paying for them, but they help with the uh, material and so forth. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tedious process. But the way this commission has all of a sudden, because we changed this ordinance, just put so much on y'all. And that's what's happening. We put so much on facilities. And I always thought this ordinance that we put in place was the wrong ordinance. Because people now, we, we, we gave up paying the little hundred dollars. And we said, oh, we'll just do it all. And now we want to just accept everybody's uh, request and petition. Uh, and it's just overflowing. And I know it's a burden on y'all because I know what we went through with GDOT. Um, and so these folks at, at some point will get what they want. But I think we do need to get petitions. I think y'all should do something. We, Because like he's, you know, you just can't get one person to say you want this. You know, it has to be a neighborhood. It's no different from speed bumps, red lights, or, or, or whatever, N naming streets. You got to have the community's input, and, and uh, that's just the way we had it in place. And I think the way we set it up now is wrong. But uh, everybody wants a light. You know, some people want a light, and like you said, some people want their privacy. I like it dark over here, and we can do our thing. So, so I, I just wanted to say that. But uh, I guess this will come back at some point. But um, it's something else we got to work on because uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not, it, it's, it's causing, a, a, it costs so much division today, you know, and it doesn't make sense that, that we're sitting here, you just never know what's going to cause an issue. <laughs> and this is something that's caused an issue with all of us today. Thank you, Commissioner Tillman. I appreciate everyone's uh, spirited to debate today. We have those on occasions and that's why we're in these seats here to, to uh, do all that. Um, if, if the only thing we're scrubbing about today is one street light, it's been a great day. <laughs> and I appreciate everyone being here today. We missed you over the last month. And if we, if we take off another month, that won't be too bad either. But we do have a meeting next Tuesday, uh, Tuesday night. We'll have a pre-commission and a commission meeting. There is no need to go into executive session, so this meeting is hereby adjourned.